So we're going to now, <clears throat> we took the limit yesterday, so we'll look a little more carefully at the region. So if we scroll back above, we went from A to B in our X's and C to D in the Y's, and we call this region S. One way to describe S was as the product, the cross product of two intervals like this. So we basically have the x's cross the y's. When we go to put the endpoints in, we need to be careful about if the x's go first or y's go second. So when we do this, there is an order of operations that you do The order of operations looks like this. If we look inside the parentheses, we're going to do our x derivative first, or I should say our x antiderivative first. So that means up here, I need my x values, not my y values. So my x values were a to b. Now if I zoom out a little bit, once we're done with the x antiderivative, we're going to do the y antiderivative, and I use the c to d for y. Because there's two different uh, variables we're going to integrate over, I'm going to actually write the x equals x equals and y equals y equals. So again, your inside antiderivative is x, and your outside is y, and that's how you want to think about this. It's not necessarily left and right, it's which one goes first, which one goes second. Now we're going to find out very soon, you can change the order, so I could rewrite it. with dy dx, and if I do this, I have the same order of operations, so I'm gonna now do my y antiderivative first, so I'm gonna go from y equals c to y equals d on my inside endpoints, and then the outside endpoints are my x's, x equals a, x equals b. So you can integrate either way, either order, Uh, it would not change it for any uh, function that we're going to look at. There, you can create some functions that are, I want to say they have to be not continuous in order to get different values when you reverse the order. So all the examples we're going to look at, you can reverse the order. All right, so one way to get the volume is do a double integral over the uh, basically the base, and that will give you the volume. So that's how to break it down. We also, we're going to go back and re-look at our region. So the way we just subdivided this up is with small, in the base they were rectangles, but it was small, let's call them rectangular columns, is how we broke this apart. I could subdivide it, if you think about this as a loaf of bread, I could slice it. So I could use slices. So if I cut it with a, uh, basically a knife or a plane, I will get two, instead of really tiny bases, what I will get is slices. So I would slice my base like this, and then I get basically slices of bread. So that would be another way to subdivide it. So we're about to look at that way of subdividing. And once we're done, we'll slice it the other direction and get a different way to subdivide it. And then what we'll show is it doesn't matter which of the three ways you do it. You get the same thing. So this is going to be volumes using cross sections.
So we have our rectangular base and we're going to first slice it. We'll go y axis here, y axis to the right, x axis going down to the left. And I'll draw the slices in blue. So there's a cross section right there. So this has an area. I can shade in the area like that. So it's if you look at your piece of toast, it's the area of uh, basically the big surface of it. So this slice has an area. Does the slice area depend on x or y? What variable would I have to change to move my slice? I'd have to move my y variable. If I move my x variable, it's an infinite plane, so I would just get the same slice. I have to change my y coordinate to move my slice around. So our slice area is a function of y. <clears throat> and our volume is going to be the sum of all the slice areas. So it'll be s of y k delta y k equals 1 to n. This is the approximation. And to get the actual volume, you take the limit as n approaches infinity, and the limit of the sum is the integral, s of y dy from y equals c to y equals d. And we're using the same limits of integration, which I will write down on the y-axis. So on the y-axis, we're going from c to d. So we're using the same y value, c to d. And x will go from a to b. All right, so that's our volume right there. Let's now slice the other way. So instead of redrawing everything, I'm just gonna go back and draw on top with the green marker. So I'm gonna slice the other way. So we'll take our loaf of bread, we'll slice it with the green. So it's going to look something like this. So we're just drawing a slice. I'm just trying to slice kind of in the middle somewhere. I don't want to draw it all the way on either end. I'm just kind of putting it in the middle. I don't want to color this one in because it's going to screw up my entire picture if I shade it in. This slice I drew the green slice. Do I change my x coordinate or y coordinate to move my slice through my volume? This is going to depend on x. So it's going to be a function of x. And we'll call this, we'll use the letter t. Slice area, we'll call this t of x. So skipping the steps, jumping right to the last step. tx dx integral from a to b. So where do s and y and t of x come from? Well, 
We actually wrote the formula down above. So I'm going to scroll back up and we're going to look at where the formula for these are written down. We have both of those right here. So let's look at the inside part right here. So forget the outer part. We have a height function. We're going to change our x coordinate. So in this right here, we're assuming that there is some y value that's not just with the part we're looking at on the board, the y value is not changing, the x value is. So we pick a y value, and then this, we're going to change the x value from a to b. So we're going to go back and look at the original volume and think about just this integral right here. So we're going to fix a y coordinate and then change our x and then find the area. So I didn't really label, no, I did label the axis. Fix a y value. So I'm just going to pick a sort of middle y value. I'll call it y naught. So I'm just picking a y value right here. That integral said <clears throat> go across all your x values from a to b. So we're going to go, uh, using that y value, we're going to go all x values between a and b. The height is the function height right here. So the area we're going to measure will be this area right here. Is that a cross section? That will be a cross section. It'll be, I think we use the T for this. I probably should have used the other color pen, but this should be the T of Y naught right here. So this will be t of y naught. So this is t of y naught right here, or just t of y. That whole thing is t of y. What do you think the bottom inner integral represents? So the first one was t of y naught. This one down here will be the other cross section, the s cross section. And this will be s of x right there. So we have a formula for t of y and s of x. So let's clean this back up in the notes. So let's write that down. S of y is the integral from a to b, fxy dx, and t of x is integral c to d, fxy dy. We got above that our volume was, let's see, right here, volume was integral sy dy from c to d. Now I'm going to substitute in s of y. So our volume was slice it this way, and now I'm just going to make this substitution right in there. So I'm just going to replace s of y by this integral. So y integral a to b, f, x, y, dx. 
So that inside part right there is S of Y. So that's one way to break the volume down. The other way to break the volume down is in green at the top of the board. Go from A to B, TX, DX. Now I'm going to sub out TX and use this version of TX and put it in place of TX. So this inside part is T of X. All right, so any questions about either of those breakdowns? So looking at what's on the board, it doesn't matter if you do a dx dy integral or dy dx integral. You can go either way. So what this tells us, either Either order gives the same volume. So one way would be slicing it in slices along one axis and then slicing it, slicing the slices along the other axis, and the other version is slicing on the other axis and then slicing your slices perpendicular. So it doesn't matter which way you slice your bread first as long as you go perpendicular on the second time around to get those little columns. <clears throat> because of this, it doesn't matter if I go dy dx or dx dy. So whenever you can commute, it doesn't really matter which order you write. So what we're going to do I'm going to write dA in place of dx dy and or dy dx. So I'm going to use dA. The reason we're using A is just represents area or a two-dimensional measurement. So we'll write our final version of our volume. So volume will be double integral, A to B, C to D, FXY, DY, DX, equals integral C to D, A to B, FXY, DX, DY. So these are the two different orders. The other way you could write it, if you want to write it both at the same time, so what I'm writing below the double integral is S, where remember S is that cross product AB cross CD. That's the region S. S is that rectangle. So that last version with the double integral across the region, written with a DA, that's sort of the generalized version of either one of these two. So it's just saying you could do dx dy or dy dx either way. So this is called Fubini's theorem. First form. So we're ready to compute some examples. So we're going to take the double integral. Our region will be 0, 2, cross with negative 1, 1. So that's our region S. The function we're going to integrate, 100 minus 6x squared y dA. So 
So you have a choice. You could do dx dy or dy dx. It doesn't matter. So let's just go dx dy for no good reason in particular. So we're going to double integral 100 minus 6x squared y. So I'm just going alphabetical here. So I'll just do x first, y second. So first thing I want you to do is fill in these four values. They're not all zero. I think exactly one of them will be zero. So fill in the four values here. Do I want x or y's for the inside values? So those should be x's, and that makes the outer values y's. So fill in the x's and the y's. Again, that was just because I picked inside my dx, inside dx, or inside derivative was x, outside derivative is y. You want to think in terms of inside, outside. So you should get 0, 2 for your x's and negative 1, 1 for your y's. So any question on those right there? I haven't shown you how to do multiple integrals, multiple antiderivatives yet. We've done partial derivatives. Let's think back to partial derivatives. We're still going to use the same order of operations I said before. So let's forget about that dy part. We're just looking at this integral dx. When you did a partial x derivative, how did you treat y? y is a constant. You do the exact same thing here. Y is just going to be a constant now. And half the screen will be bright white. All right, so I'm doing an x antiderivative here. So antiderivative of 100 is 100x. What is the antiderivative of negative 6x squared y? So let's take a guess, negative 2x cubed y. How do I know if this is right? Take a derivative. So we're going to take an x derivative. So I'll have 6x squared y with a negative, which is what I started with. All right, so I'm just doing guess and check here. You can also just add one to the power, divide by the new power. That's the, the regular anti-power rule. Now my x coordinates are 0, 2. So any questions on our first partial antiderivative? They're really not difficult as long as you keep track of what variable you're taking your antiderivative with. And all I'm doing, I'm intentionally putting these parentheses in here so that I'm just messing around inside the parentheses, not worried about the second integral yet. You, have, you basically have to deal with the endpoints before you take your next antiderivative. Okay. Because it's important that, yes, you do have to take care of this before you take your antiderivative, your next antiderivative. All right, so are 0 and 2 x or y values? x. So what that means is y stays y. y doesn't become a number. y is going to remain y. So don't mess around with y. So 100 times 2 minus 2 times 2 cubed y minus 0 minus 0.
All right, you finish the integral right now. I'll give you a minute. This should be a very easy Calc 1 antiderivative. All right, any questions on getting 400? So we'll do our next and last example in this section. We're going to look for the volume between the xy planes region 0, 1, cross 0, 2. And the function 10 plus x squared plus 3y squared. So I'm going to really quickly graph the region that we're graphing over. That region right there is S. So I said find the volume between XY planes region S right here and this function. So this function <coughs> will have some height. How do I know that the function value is going to be above the region S? Plenty of functions have negative values. How do I know this function we're looking at is going to have positive values over this region? So x and y's are squared, which means the variable part is never going to be less than 0. I'm also adding 10 to a number never less than 0. So this function is always going to be a positive value. In fact, the smallest value will be 10 and higher. So I don't have to worry about uh, the, two, the height function becoming negative. So I don't have to worry about any types of intersections. So I'll just draw a really fast sketch. I have no idea what the function is really going to look like. It's probably not going to be constant, but just doing a really fast sketch of some surface over top of the region S. Now, I'd say it's going to be taller than 10, 10 and taller, so it should be drawn higher up than I drew it, but this will be good enough for our purposes. Well, I can't, I could, I, it's a two dimensional object, so if I parameterize it, I have to use two parameters. Is there a way of algebraically looking at one side of it, though, like a two-dimensional side? Like with the we don't need to parameterize it to do anything here. The sine plus x cubed function that we did? It's not quite going to have some circular property unless it was like an extra three like that. I guess you could say you can consider it sort of as an ellipse but, type, but you're reading into it way too far. We're just going to just apply the area or the volume uh, 
antiderivative. That's all. So our volume is going to be the double integral over the region S of fxy dA. So our function is 10 plus x squared plus 3y squared. We did the last one dx dy. Let's get crazy and go dy dx this time around. So I'm intentionally doing it the other order. And I want you to now pick the four, well you're not picking the endpoints, so put the right number in the right position for the endpoints. And just remember y is the interior. So your interior endpoints should be y's, your exterior endpoints are x's. And then go ahead and find the actual volume of this, uh, of this shape.
So any questions about endpoints or any of the antiderivatives? So these questions, the antiderivatives I picked were intentionally not tricky in terms of the actual finding the antiderivatives. <clears throat> all right, so that is all there is to rectangular regions. So what we're going to do in the next section is we're going to use regions that are not rectangles. So we're going to slowly make our regions worse until they uh, are relatively ugly and don't have any flat sides. So the first ugliness that we'll introduce is we'll take regions that kind of look like this that have two flat sides and then we'll look at regions that have flat sides like this top and bottom that are flat and then we'll make them even worse afterwards. So we'll kind of generalize our regions out until they're relatively ugly. <clears throat>